and it happened and it feels like the end of the movie finale scene where you're like, like all the dreams come true. Suddenly overnight, it's like you have a record deal with the coolest record company in the world. And for a number of reasons, it just crashed and burned at every level that you could imagine. Today, I have the privilege of bringing you a guest who is called fantastically talented by the one and only Jay-Z. The singer, songwriter, children's book author, and children's podcast creator was formally signed to Island Def Jam Records by the legendary L.A. Reid, was the first ever recipient of the Songwriter Hall of Fame Buddy Holly Prize from Songmasters, and she's had songs featured on the globally adored interactive video game Just Dance. She is the voice of Summer TV on Netflix and Amazon with two songs prominently featured on Amazon's new prime video dating series, The One That Got Away, that premiered in late June and Netflix series, Boo Bitch, which premiered in early July. Her debut album, Laura, is out now. My guest is the Gigi Rowe. I'm Aiden Meepom, and this is The Changed Podcast. This is episode 51 of The Changed Podcast. Here's Gigi's story. Basically, I was just like living it at 24-7 in New York City, singer-songwriter, performing wherever I could perform, found my way to Sony Music Studios, was in a writer's room, literally 24-7, would go in in daytime or in nighttime and walk out of the studio when it was the opposite two days later and was in and out of sessions. There were a lot of rap hip hop sessions. I was working with a producer and a mixer and engineer. His name is Rich Keller. He's someone that really believed in me in such a beautiful way and heard me sing a song and was like, like that was sold. Was like kind of, oh, you're coming with me and was helping me to, to, not even find my voice. He just had such a respect for me as an artist, as a singer, as a songwriter, and was created this sort of incredible space for me to be me and was just very inspired and wanted to help and created opportunities for me to sing in front of some of the biggest music executives in New York City. And it there was an unbelievable energy, as you can imagine, in and out of the studio, rehearsal spaces, performing in meetings, like running around with my guitar. And then the, the week that I wound up getting offered a record deal, I was going to showcase for Columbia Records or maybe a few other labels as well. So I was rehearsing in this studio space in Manhattan and getting all ready for this big showcase. And then coincidentally, Rich had shared had been sharing some of my music whenever he could in sessions where he was working on an artist and there was someone from the label there. He'd be like, oh, like, check check out my girl or like strategically play some of my music. And so an A&R from Island Def Jam had, or Def Jam actually, had really responded to my voice and my song and said he wanted to play it for L.A. Reid. But that had like happened months earlier. So kind of all the stars aligned in this moment. And this A&R, his name is Shalik Berry. He wound up calling Rich. Like I woke up on a Sunday morning with, you know, 15 missed calls from Rich. And I was like, what's what's going on here? And I stumble out of my apartment that I was living in. I had a friend who actually had, she's a fabulous hairstylist and she'd given me a haircut, a kitchen scissor <laughs> haircut the night before because she didn't have her like scissors with her. And I was like, oh my God, let's like do a fresh look. So my friend and I were having the best time. I was living on 48th and 8th. We like, you know, Sunday morning, beautiful. It was like October in New York City, which is just like one of those glittering bright sunny fall days and we were going to Starbucks of course and then I saw I had 15 missed calls so I called Rich and he just sounded so elated and was oh my gosh like it's all happening like your dreams are coming true and then he told me the story of how he'd gotten the call and Shalik had played my music for LA Reid the night before and LA was like where is she I need to see her now so then he it tells me that 
LA is going to be coming to see me that night, Sunday night, in a rehearsal for a showcase that I was supposed to do later that week. So then I'm on cloud nine. You feel like you're just like walking on air. And I felt prepared. We have been uh, rehearsing a seven song, like mini rock concert with a band. It was really powerful, impactful. And it was just like every, that moment was everything and more. And I think that no matter what's happened since or the ch- many challenges that I've had since and the feeling like I'm hit, coming up against a, a brick wall, I don't think anything can really take away from what that actual night was because LA came with Shalik and with someone else from the label and just from start to finish, it was that like this movie scene where you wouldn't have, it was perfect. And Rich was doing sound and he was just like, my, my, my real name, Gigi Rowe wasn't created at this point. I hadn't even come up with the name Gigi Rowe. And he was just like, Laura, the stage is yours. So then I went into my set and it flowed and I could tell, you could feel the energy. It was like electric and I could feel that L.A. Reid was with me like every note, every second in the moment, right right there. And so then I was feeding off of that energy and his hands were like in the air, riding it. And then the last song was just myself and my guitar. My band left the stage and it was a song called Fly Away. And there's this like massive high note that I hit at the end. It's super intimate. And then it gets like really powerful. And I could just feel the magic of that note. And then when I finished the song, he's just like, wow, wow. What? Couldn't stop saying that. And was like, just, oh my, like, oh my God, like what just happened? And I was feeling the same way. So I walked off stage and he's just, wow. And he's from a, from a business standpoint, I don't know what you're doing. If you want it, you have a home with Island Records. So that's pretty amazing thing to happen. It was that was a big moment, and that's where it felt like it was a bit of a warped sense of change, though, because and I think it's impacted me over time. Because you're like, oh my god, like change can happen like that, like suddenly you work and work, and yes, there are those lightning moments, absolutely, in life. And I've had more of those over the years, but in that moment, you feel like the door has just flung open and I'm like in an, in another world. And for a number of reasons, like that just didn't wind up. That wasn't the moment. It wasn't my time in that moment. And what I've had to tell myself is that was just a really cool mm. stepping stone. Up next, my interview with Gigi Rowe. Gigi, hello. I'm excited that you're here. I'm excited to meet you and you look amazing. Hi, Aiden. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to meet you and just can't wait for our conversation today. What are your thoughts about fate? Ooh, I really am a great believer that what's meant to be is. And I think Mm -hmm. the more I lean into that every single day, the more magical my life is. And sometimes you you have moments where it's hard to believe in fate and in destiny mm-hmm. and that there really are no accidents and everything's interwoven into this like beautiful collage that is your life. And some moments yeah. are easier to celebrate than others and some moments really challenge you. But I think that we do get those experiences where you can look back and be like, oh, I I understand why that happened or that made sense. It's really fun when the universe is like, hey, girl, we got you and put something or someone in your path that feels very obvious. I love that. So then listening to you talk about the universe putting things in your path, do you also think that we have some sort of like, you hear people talk about manifesting what they want or creating their future or um, changing who they are. Where does that fall within the realm of the universe's path for you? I I feel like it's like working with the universe. 
Like I, I really believe in fate and destiny, but at the same time, I feel like we do have the ability to get in our own way. Mm -hmm. And I think like the universe is busy. So our job is to help the universe help you. The more that you are in alignment, the more that you are clear on who you are, on what you want and what, and the relationship you have with yourself and the universe, mm -hmm. I think the more likely it is that you're going to live out that fate and that destiny that is meant for you, that is written in the stars. But I think there are moments where you can get knocked off your path and it can be tough to, to get, get back on. I'm thinking of the yellow brick road right now. Get back on the road that you're meant to be on. And in some mm -hmm. ways, as I'm talking, I feel like there's a friction or a contradiction between what I'm saying now and what I said before of, yep, fate and destiny. But I do think that it's a relationship between yourself and the universe and constantly being mindful of that, that enables this whole kind of magical thing called life. You're in a magical moment. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But before we get there, speaking of life and the journey and destiny and all of these things, before we get there, I felt like we have some things in common. And I just, I felt like it would be a, a missed opportunity for me if we didn't bond over that. I'm so ready. <laughs> okay. I think so, I know what you're going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about wigs. I really want to talk about wigs. So something that I think is really, will probably be surprising to some of my audience it, because I have, this is my hair and I get a lot you of questions awesome about hair, by the way. Thank you so much. Uh, and I make my own hair products and I, for me, and I don't share them with anybody. They just make them in my kitchen. <laughs> for me. <laughs> but, and I'm happy to share recipes with people. Feel free to email me at podcast at artofchange.com. But I also have this like deep and abiding love of wigs as a person from a performance background. And so the first music video of yours that I ever saw was Lollipops. And you've got a few wigs that you wear in that video. So I was like, I want to, I want to play a little bit of, I'll show, I'll show you mine. If you show me yours, that sounds terrible, but I'm talking about wigs. Oh, we are having a wig moment. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. I have two bags of wigs. Actually, they're currently in my car because I'm road tripping today. Oh my but, gosh. Um, today I knowing having heard that maybe you love wigs. I was like, oh, we're definitely going to rock a wig moment. And that's why I'm feeling this lavender bob that's a little darker purple on the top at the roots. And then it like comes out. It almost has the silver sheen to it. So I this one's it. super fun. I love the bob style in general. I have a friend that creates wigs for Broadway shows. So she will custom make them and dye them. And we the collaboration is... Oh my God, that's... So on, as you can imagine. I'm so very jealous because I'm going to, I'm going to show you my first wig. I'm going to show it to you right now. I'm also going to do something that I've never done before. And I'm going to show you my wow. hand. I'm going to show you my handmade wig cap and make my own wig caps and I'm going to put it on. And my audience is going to see that when you have thick hair, this is how you make it all disappear. So you can wear a, like a kitten wig or whatever they call it. Those little like Tiny short wigs. All right. Are we ready? Here we go. Wow. This is what I... amazing. Hey, you look like... Look at your beautiful face. It's amazing <laughs> when you put a wig cap on it. You can like... You just totally... The transformation is, is very real. This reminds me deeply of Harold and Maude, one of my favorite movies, which is from the 70s and the like eccentric rich mother wears wigs all the time. So they, you see her in the dressing room with her wig cap on. Um, all right. I'm going to show you my very first Yay! wig. This is from a show that I was in called Start Trekkin', uh, an improv show where we played a crew of a complimentary ship in the Star Trek universe with all made up characters. And this wig inspired me. It reminded me of Yeoman Rand. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. Uh, and then later I used the same wig 
to play a, a 60s housewife. That's incredible. It's the show. This was in Austin, Texas at the Hideout Theater. It's interesting to me how different wigs come to life yes. in different moments. Absolutely. Where you put it on. And some days you're like feel, really feeling it, at least for me. Like some days I put them on and I'm like, oh my gosh, I remember this moment when I wore this. I put it on and I'm like, not moment anymore. Like yeah. this is not working. Or And then you put something else on that's unexpected. And then it really comes to life in a way that you didn't even see it coming. And that's part of, that's part of the fun. It's really enhances, I think, creativity. Yeah, totally. I love about it. That's so much fun on you. I want to see another one. Okay. You said you have two bags of wigs. I have a box of wigs. And actually, my husband's an oh. actor too. And when we first got together, I was like, so here's my box of wigs. And he was like, oh, here's my box of wigs. <laughs> and and you were like, we're getting married. Yeah, it was like <laughs> uh, meant to be. Our, I'm literally, our studio is actually embedded in our costume closet, which is a thing. And we only use these things for shows. Like we just do... We're performers. That's what we use them for. But so I have a friend who knew about my collection of wigs. I wore this in the Rocky Horror Show. And so she started so fun. sending me wigs as gifts. She was like, you're into these and I'll never wear them. So some of them are, this is a long, <laughs> fabulous rainbow wig. But because of your blazer, I was like, I think a dusty pink is in order. I that's what I love. Dusty pink. Mm -hmm. That is what the color is. I was trying to come up with what it was. And I was like, is it a vintage pink? Is it like a bubblegum pink? But dusty pink, that is my favorite way to describe what this color is. So I've never worn this wig before. Looks like we've got a little Ooh. bit of an A-line bob maybe with a side swept bang. This is cool. So we're going to we're gonna experience this together. And then Yay! maybe I'll wear this for the interview. Maybe I'll just leave it on. I'm a fan. Oh my gosh, I love it. Yes. That is that that style looks so good on you. So shout out to Marjorie, the former co-host of mine for the Positive Thin Pack, my first podcast, um, for this amazing gift. And I'm loving it with these earrings too. That looks incredible on you. I'm like a totally different person. I don't even look like that housewife anymore. Oh. <laughs> Who? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're just all right. I'm gonna leave this on for a little while. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But um, thank you. I love it. We're now we're so coordinated. Now we're coordinated, and I feel like we've bonded. <laughs> oh, we've totally bonded. Oh my gosh. Do you remember your first wig? What did it look like? I did an epic photo shoot in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and. I got to wear all these wigs and I transformed into these different characters for a music video shoot. And it was after that where I was really inspired to pull wigs and like performance pieces yeah. into everyday life and try that and finally be like, I'm Gigi Bro. And I was changing outfits so many times a day and wearing six inch heels and glitter and finding myself at the wig shop all the time on Ventura Boulevard in the Valley in Los Angeles. So there was, there were a couple, there were so many different wigs that I wore at that shoot. And then f fast forward to a music video, my first music video as Gigi Rowe. And I'm thinking about a blue Bob style wig that I would really consider to be like my first wig as Gigi Rowe because that was a centerpiece of this music video mm -hmm. shoot that I did for Run the Night, which was a song that was on the Just Dance video game and this sort of introduced Gigi Rowe in, into the earthly world. Yeah. And this was the first time I collaborated with my friend who has made a lot of wigs. So I got to go to her the studio where she works in Manhattan in the theater district and it was a whole experience and getting to collaborate with her and it's blue and then there's hints of like pink underneath oh, cool. and the cut and that was so I, I feel like that was really a moment that's awesome I, I, I love that and it just sounds so fun it sounds just like a tremendously exciting moment yes I love that you say that because I feel like that's what I love to impart to people to 
fans that I connect with of all ages. I'm really appreciative. It's taken me a minute to appreciate this, but my creativity takes me on so many different paths. And I think just owning that and knowing that it's all authentically me and it's okay to write a kid's book and do a kid's podcast and then do music that just like really speaks to me and would talk to my contemporaries and perform in so many different kinds of environments. But through that, I love to say that my world is for ages three to 300 and it truly (laughs) is. And I think that I love that sense of that spirit Mm -hmm. that that something in my world or about me or my personality or the wigs or the fashion or the music, whether it's emo or dancey or pop can impart some sort of, Ooh, like spark inspiration, hope. I, I can live out my dreams too. And when you just said, Oh, it sounds like fun. I'm like, yes, exactly. That's like how you want people to leave the Gigi row world or leave an interaction with me being like, that was just like so much. That was fun. We need more fun in our lives, in the world. And that doesn't have to mean that the music all has to be like upbeat and Mm up-tempo and playful and whimsical. You can still like make people cry through your music or give them music to keep them company in the downtime or the moments that where you just need to turn to something for comfort. But by fun, I think it's like there's something fresh, there's something inspiring, there's the possibilities and that idea like anything can happen. Well, let's know? talk let's talk a little bit about something you just said, which is that having fun and being driven by fun and whatever, pursuing the challenge of it all does not mean that it's necessarily everything is upbeat and happy all the time. Um you just released a track a little bit ago, uh Lonely Together. Holy clothes, lonely for you and me lonely together I come from being more like serious singer songwriter yeah. or like making people cry or like, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to sing you a song that's I'm going to change your life right now that's the that's where I come from and over time have found my way to super fun, dancing music, performing at Miami Beach Gay Pride, bringing out these other sides of me and wondering if one, like the value of one versus the other. Yeah. And having come to a realization of the value of that you can do whatever you want, that you can wear whatever you want and make whatever kind of music you want. And you can be serious, but have a really colorful outfit on (laughs) or you can be like really emo and like be super bubbly. And sometimes that makes it even more interesting when it creates even more mystery. Oh, I love that perspective. I am going to take off this wig though. I can feel my hair is like freshly washed and it's stop smashing (laughs) me. And it's okay. How is it so perfect? Coming out of the well, I only had the wig cap on for 10 minutes. That's not even okay. That's not even fair (laughs) right now. (laughs) I'll tell you the hair gel that I use to hold my curls is just incredible. And it's just a recipe I caught off of the watching YouTube. I was like, I want to make my own stuff and have less chemicals in my system. Surely someone on YouTube figured this out already. And you know what? They did. They, a lot of people had already figured it out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you're in Arkansas or on your way to Arkansas, where you recently were for a collaboration with TikToker Clay Baby on the track So Iconic, yes. which, b- by the way, is actually one of my favorite songs right now. I just think it's so good. I just think it's so good. You're going back? Is it for the same reason? Are you doing another collaboration? What's the story there? I am going back. I'm so excited. I'm road tripping in my little silver Mustang. It's going to be incredible. We just have an incredible mm-hmm. energy between us, a, a friendship. We're like two souls that were must have been connected in another life. And I'm just so inspired by getting to know Clay, getting to work with him. 
He's from the middle of nowhere, Texas. He's a really inspiring story in that he, from where he comes from and built up this fan base of over Mm -hmm. 6 million followers. And I love that I come from such a different background, but somehow we're very connected are genuine fans of each other. And we just seem to really understand. How did you find each other? How did that happen? It's so funny through TikTok. I popped into a live stream of his. It turned out he was a fan of Gigi Rowe music and then was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe Gigi Rowe's in my live stream right now. And then he was sharing my music with his fans. And it was such a genuine response to me and to my music that I was like, oh, this guy is so cool. I just loved his personality. He's got such a gift in how he connects with people. I've created, as we mentioned, a podcast called Posey Flynn Sings, and I thought it would be incredible to have him voice a character. So I was doing a live stream one day and he popped into the live stream and I was like, I have the show. Would you want to be a character? And he was just like, yes, I would love to. So that prompted us to get on our first phone call. This was a couple months ago after knowing of each other for almost a year or something like that, where we were both like, oh, there's a vibe there. So we got on a call, wound up talking for hours. I learned that his first love is music. And I was like, oh, let's make records together. Yes. And we just started chatting and FaceTiming and throwing around ideas and sending music back and forth and just shared our stories. And then it became really clear to me that we had to get together in person to make some mm-hmm. magic happen, to live stream together, to make TikTok videos. And it in a day and age where it's less important to be with people physically in the yeah. same space, what's so fun about our collaboration is it's essential. It's the most incredible thing to watch. He'll come up with an idea that's so funny. He will <laughs> have a physical response to his own idea. I've like, I never, I haven't seen anything like it. So it was so meaningful for me to connect with someone where he saw TikTok and he was like, oh my Oh, I, like I get it. For me to step into that world from where I come from, which is such a music industry background. I was signed by L.A. Reid to Island Def Jam. I was running around New York City and playing for any and every executive, doing meetings, doing showcases, and very much coming from the music er- industry is constantly mm-hmm. changing, but a bit of a, a different era of where I come from or where I started. Right. Because in the music that industry. was when, when and, how old were you when you were, or how many years ago were you signed to Def Jam and went on that journey? It was in, it was like the end towards the end of 2000. It was the very end of 2006. So I, I was a child prodigy, actually right out of the womb. I got my first record deal. L.A. Reid was like, oh, my God, you have the most incredible voice I've ever heard. Jay-Z was like, listen to this, baby, sing. Singing before um, talking, so, just like you do. I, I mean, that I actually was doing, but it was, it's was. it been an epic journey for me and just so cool to feel – you always you want to you have to feel of the times like it's something that's different. It's not even an age thing because I truly believe like I I say to people I'm timeless and ageless. What I really mean by that is as an artist, when you break, when you come into the kind of when people have an awareness of who you are or connect with a song, like essentially once you break, you become timeless and ageless as an artist. And before you break, you're not the right anything. It's People are always looking to shoot Mm -hmm. holes in something. And so I'm like, you know what? Timeless and ageless. We're going to roll with that. And it really transcends an age. It's about how are you connecting with the times? What's the social relevance? Is there something about you or what you're creating or channeling that people Mm -hmm. want or that people can connect to. And as as an artist, I think you're always just looking for bridges. If you're an artist and you want to do it as a career, then yes, you want to be inspired by what you're doing. That's why you do it. I wrote songs because I was like, oh, this is my own language. This is my own way of engaging with the world. This makes me feel special. This makes me feel like I have something to give. And then at a certain point, you're like, who am I really Mm -hmm. speaking to? And so you're always just looking for those, for the bridge to get you and 
what you're doing to be able to connect with people. So it's been incredibly inspiring and very fresh and very fun to get the opportunity to collaborate so closely with Clay and for each of us to open our worlds to each other. We've just understood like early on in our conversations that our experiences really complement each other. And there's a really a beautiful friendship that kind there's of there's a real beauty to is- collaboration like that. That's um in my line of work, I help people collaborate with each other who often have different perspectives on something they're trying to solve for since I'm working in the workplace on those things. And I'm always struck by how how the differences are noticeable when a team has totally different experiences and backgrounds showing up to their ideation sessions or when people are all from the same line of thinking and background and experiences. There's just something particularly magical when you take differences and smash them together. You learn from each other, but also you create something that's really balanced and interesting at the same time versus the echo chamber of I like this. Me too. So let's make something that's just exactly like that. I really like that. That's cool how you talk about Mm -hmm. an echo chamber. And I think that there is such a magic. I totally agree. And it feels like there's the scrappiness there for what I want to do in the world for my, I'm a go big or go home kind of girl. And let's go connect with millions of people around the world. And let's, I I don't know what's going to happen exactly. Don't have the roadmap, but we're going to figure it out. Clay and I have the same mentality. We just are just different people. So when you put us together, there's this scrappiness that that happens, this the spontaneousness, the let's try this. And nobody else is doing what we're doing because we're such characters, both of us as individuals. And that's why we can probably understand and relate to each other so much. And we're just having so much fun. And for sure, there have been moments where I'm like, am I crazy? Am I one of those people that goes to Arkansas and get <laughs> off the internet? But at the same time, I'm like, no, there's just something, there's something real here. It just feels like we're like, really, it's like family. It's like somehow we're connected. So I think there's endless possibilities with what he and I can do together creatively. And it's like a friendship that we'll just keep developing. But again, it's that fate and destiny that we, where we kind so, of started the conversation. One of the things that I'm curious about is when you think about the moments of your life, the, the different stories that you often tell to people about the journey you've been on from babyhood to now, is it easy or is it hard to identify a moment that you feel like was particularly filled with change or carried significant change to it is like how easy or hard is it to identify these moments the moment that always comes to mind is this experience of getting my record deal but it's a very there's a lot mm. of friction for me in looking back on that moment because it felt like this great moment of change that, wow, this is it. This is what I've worked so hard for. And it happened. And it feels like the end of the movie finale scene where you're like, like all the dreams come true. And that suddenly overnight, it's like you have a record deal with the coolest record company in the world. And we're going to pay a lot of money to be an art, like all the things. And some of my favorite artists, whether it's at the time it was Rihanna and the Killers and Bon Jovi and Fall Out Boy and the list goes on and on. Mariah Carey, like of the artists that were associated with this label. And then you suddenly feel like, wow, change is happening. And for a number of reasons, it just crashed and burned at every level that you could imagine. So that's Mm -hmm. why I say there's friction because I was like, I look back on this as this is like one of those moments But then it wasn't. So how, what the uh, ripple effect of that for me over time and how I've sort of analyzed it from every different perspective in retrospect, that was just a really cool part of the puzzle and part of the journey and showed me that this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. 
this is that was a, an example of that. And then there have been many others which are like, hey girl, in case you're doubting yourself, I'm like, hey girl, like, <laughs> that's how the universe talks. Hey girl, um, like in case when you're doubting yourself, when you're questioning what you're what you're here for, like here in like life for, here are mo- we're going to give you moments that are going to show you mm-hmm. that you're on the right path. And every artist that I admire, there's no roadmap. You have to find and build your own story and you figure that out along the way and be open and trust your instincts. And sometimes you just need to cry it out. Yeah. How <laughs> yeah. long was it? Um, how long was it that first opportunity fell, first big opportunity fell apart? I wound up being dropped in 2009. Wow. So it was a lengthy period of time and communication was a big issue that my A&R was, loved how he believed in me. But he was someone where he'd call you and be like, I'm on my way to the studio and then like would never show up. And then you'd call him and it would go right to voicemail. And then he would call you a month later and be like, oh, sorry, like my apartment flooded. My mom's in the hospital. And then the call would get cut off. And then he'd call you a month later. And I'm like, not even kidding. So if that's the person whose job it is to work your project through the building, that's 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 problematic. And I was also singer songwriter from New Jersey that was brought in through Def Jam. Like my A&R worked for Def Jam and some of the people that would have been helpful to really champion my project were on Island Records. Mm -hmm. And obviously they have their own projects and LA Reid is busy and he's the CEO and it's, we're going to, put you in the next quarter, in the next quarter. And then suddenly time passes and a meeting with him gets canceled. And then you're passed off to another executive. But was there a moment oh, when, before it actually fully was a dissolved contract, was there a moment when you were like, I think they're going to drop me? Like the whole thing, huh. the entire situation felt flawed. For a number of reasons, it was like, from the start, it was a difficult situation. And then I felt like I was making choices mm. along the way that were not helping. Now, people have said to me, they were like, there's nothing you could have done. This was just a tough, this was just a tough situation. But I feel like at different times, there's such an emphasis in yeah. life on team building in the entertainment industry. Like you're as, your team matters a lot. And I felt that at that time, I wasn't able to empower myself with a team that I felt great about, that I could really lean into, that I could really put myself in a situation where I could thrive. And I'm sure in looking back, I wish that I could have been a little clearer or trusted my own instincts even more, trusted myself, trusted the journey, trusted my whatever talent I had. And I think some of what I've learned over time or you, we all like marinate (laughs) and then we come out hopefully a stronger, um, better version of ourselves. And we all have insecurities and vulnerabilities, but to be able to take ownership of our lives, stand our ground, know who we are, know, understand the why. And I think I inherently knew all those things, or we inherently know who we are at a very fundamental level, but at more superficial levels, you can get caught up in, in things that don't matter. You can be distracted by like shiny things over here when you need to stay centered and grounded. But I was also swept up in the undertow as well. That was the feeling of this situation. Uh, But in retrospect, I was like, I was introduced to different managers or like different doors opened to me. And it felt like Mm. I was jumping at the wrong times and then waiting at the wrong times, jumping when I should have waited, waiting when I should have jumped in to give myself a better shot. And then it's challenging because you can 
then start to get right. a little momentum. But then you're like, wait, this isn't right either. Hold on. What am I doing? Or I don't believe in this now. And honestly, that's all, as Bruce Springsteen said about something, if it doesn't, you know, drive uh, you yeah. insane, it'll make you great. But the friction, the contradiction, the, I, I love this. I hate this. I, I, I'm this, I'm that. This is like the end of the world. The- <laughs> Life is a dance is another expression that I think describes that moment, particularly of like when to move, when to pause, um, which direction to move in. Life really is a dance. And it sounds like at the time, and maybe this is what people mean when they say, you know, you did everything you could, or this was out of your hands. You're just dancing to the best of your ability in the moment with the dance moves that you know. And with any kind of dancing, the more you do, the more you learn. So I'm curious, you're, you are literally changed now. Gigi Rowe is, is like persona, a character, a, a, like a dynamo, right? How connected is Gigi Rowe to that period of your life or disconnected or different or same? I think I love that. Yes. Gigi, we love her. I feel like I want to be a fan of Gigi Rowe. I want to be in the front row cheering Gigi Rowe on. And also it's as- she's aspirational for me. I get to be on stage and also, wow, that's Gigi Rowe. And that's what I wanted. I think that at a certain point, I'm like, there's something more. I want a world that I can throw all of my creativity in and all of my interests and all of my passions. And I love being Laura Warshower, a singer-songwriter from New Jersey, really proud of who I am, where I come from, my family, my story at different times have wondered if I turned my back on (laughs) her, not to talk about myself in the third person. But I think there's like a fine line between art and armor. And at different, different moments, Gigi Rowe has been both for me, like this like protector of Laura, of Laura's protector. Hold on. No one's going to mess with me anymore. After feeling like su- super vulnerable as, as just like myself or like you start writing songs because you're like, oh my gosh, I like have no, nowhere else to say this. I'm going to write a song about it. And so that obviously is a very vulnerable thing. And then when you feel crushed, you're like, I'm going to like, I'm not going to feel that way again. So I'm going to create Gigi Rowe. So that's the armor part. But at the same time, I feel like Gigi Rowe was always meant to evolve into Gigi Rowe. And this was, there's something very real about her. There's something real about this world. There's something that I'm meant to say through Gigi Rowe. And that's become clear over time. And it's been a constant process of who and what is Gigi Rowe? (laughs) And at some moments that's clearer to me than others. And I think more than anything, it's Mm. like Gigi Rowe is a blank canvas for me every day to finger paint on however I want to. And that's sort of- I love the visual. That's such a specific level of imagery. And to me, it's really nice because you do so much um, across the gambit from children's content, which really is like finger painting, right? To this like high fashion, fun, playful club experience uh, and pride and all of that to- to your newest album, Laura, which actually has a lot of depth to it. Do you want to talk a little bit about your latest album? Sure. I would love to. It's a really exciting time to be able to put out this body of work and to call it Laura. And it felt right because as I've been trying to figure out, all right, who is Gigi Rowe and who is Laura? And there's only kind of so far you can run. I think you, we all spend a lifetime kind of simultaneously mm-hmm. running towards something and running from something. And this album is a collection of songs that throughout the years, it's been 10 years in the making, not like a solid 10 years of recording, but it's really based around a collaboration with a producer that I love working with. His name is PJ Bianco. And we started with the song called Running from the Grave, which happened in Los Angeles. Like that was recorded about 10 years ago. It's just come out. That was a game 
life-changing experience for me, making a record, collaborating with PJ, the way that I describe the connection I have with Clay Baby. PJ and I have that like cosmic connection. And we joke, we were like brother and sister in another life or something. And there's, I just love when you step into a room with someone, you're like, I don't know, it's about to happen, but I know it's going to be amazing, whatever it is. We got the chance to work together last summer on a hundred acre farm in New Jersey. We both happen to be from New Jersey, even though we connected in California. And it was just like the most magical moment of and a moment that I never knew I'd get in this lifetime. It's this old school recording process of you arrive at the studio, you don't know what to, the, the unknown, the willingness to dive in the deep end together. Night, we'll, we're, we'll work through the night. The sunsets on the farm, walks around the farm, seeing horses like stroll by the studio, that kind of, full-on immersion where you're really going to get to the good stuff and you work until you can't anymore and then you wake up the next day and you cut vocals and I'll curl up on the floor or I'm like moving around the studio or trying the handheld mic or up at the studio mic or let's try this, let's try that, what's working and there's nothing like getting to work with him cutting vocals. It's like being with a great director on set because like his reactiveness in the moment of Oh, try this, try that sound. Um, okay, if you were British, how would you say that? I'll make that cooler. Okay, I don't want to understand what you're saying there. What's Cindy Lauper do here? And that's happening so quickly. And then you get these like magical vocals. And those moments where for Lonely Together, you were chatting about that song. That was an instance where kind of took a minute to settle into those vocals and then I sat on the floor with a handheld mic and then mm. just was in the zone and we could both feel it and, then I was like, <laughs> oh. and this is the record and then the stayed at the studio all night until the sun starts to come up it was this magical summer I was in New Jersey staying there with family and we just bottled lightning and it was cool, and I feel like the the records are something that that stand up in our listeners of this show will of course be able to find the link to have access to your lightning in a bottle in the show notes, which is absolutely available now um thank you for sharing all of those thoughts and stories like i it's really cool to hear the artist's journey. I think so often people want to talk about their successes and this and this story that you shared about being signed is a success story but it's not a success story full stop it has all of these complicated real life realities that are stirred into that cocktail so i just want to say thank you for sharing all of that the question that i have for you is when you think about change in general, like life changing moments or going through changes, what are your, how, how do you connect with that word? Is that a meaningful word to you or is it a, like a kind of a hollow word? There's, I love the expression. There's a lot to unpack there. It is. <laughs> it's a big word. I think. When I sometimes with change, the word evolution comes up mm -hmm. in my mind because I think about people and I, I feel like people, we are who we are. And I feel like fundamentally mm -hmm. people evolve more than they actually change, if that makes sense. And I think the openness, I think it's really, I think openness is the most important thing to be open to our ideas, our inspirations, what motivates us on a daily basis, what are, where we're headed in the big picture, what are the morning coffee, like that, the, those, all the little moments and then the big moments. And I think that we give ourselves the opportunity to evolve. I resonate with that answer. I, something I've been thinking a, a lot about lately um, in terms of change, in terms of personal evolution is um, about these moments when someone, I know I've experienced a couple of these myself, 
changes a strongly held belief about something, whether it's themselves, whether it's about a, a group of people, about how the world works, about religion or politics, whatever. I'm really fascinated by that particular evolution. And I'm curious if you have a, any thoughts about like, what do you think changes people's minds? What does it take to change a mind? Actually, you know, it's what it's really interesting. What just popped in my mind, I've gotten the opportunity now with Clay Baby and a lot of Clay's friends and just through many experiences getting, and I have so many friends who are part of the LGBTQ plus community, and I'm absolutely an ally of that community. And I love, I've very organically gotten to hear so many stories recently mm -hmm. about relationships with family members, with friends, the, what it's like to come out, what it's like to be your authentic self. And it's really been interesting to hear about stories where someone is not accepted at all. And then over time, how the points of views change. Mm -hmm. And, and what that takes and what, where those awakenings come from. And I think some of it is, it's time, it's perspective, it's the world changing, the collective viewpoints changing around you. It's, mm -hmm. I think it gets back to that openness. Even if someone is closed minded, there's something that has to happen to, to make someone be like, hold on. Maybe there's more here. Maybe there's a way that I can be open to ideas that I was not open to before. And I think that's something that really resonates with me when I hear just people's stories and relationships, how relationships yeah. evolve, forgiveness mm -hmm. of how people are raised in different ways and people's ideologies come from so many different sources. And I think that what does it take to change? I love that question because I think that it's really fascinating when like someone, when you really mm -hmm. respect someone and you have time to hear their story and then they just organically come out and say, and in that moment, I knew like in that moment, I was not going to be that person or I was not going to go down yeah. that path or I wanted something more for myself. And when you get to hear those stories without even prompting someone. Those are the most inspiring, really the most inspiring moments because that's, that's what it means to be alive, to be human, to grow, to come into your own, to figure out sometimes and trying to figure out who we are, we have to figure out what we're not. And there's these moments that can be they can be big or small. They can, from an outsider's perspective, be like, oh, I get why that was a change <laughs> moment. Or it can be like, really? Like that, that did it? It doesn't have to be this monumental thing. It doesn't have to happen on the world stage. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. be, the stakes don't have to be high necessarily. Sometimes it takes outsider's perspectives for you to realize change in yourself or for people who know you to be able to see and recognize change. And for ourselves, we're caught up in our own worlds, whether we want to be or not. And it's easy to be, yeah. it's easy to get stuck as well. And I was thinking about that recently that when you're stuck, the most important thing is to take that next step. And oftentimes you don't know which way is forward mm -hmm. when you're really, when you're really stuck, like you have no idea which way is forward. So just take a step. doesn't matter. Backwards, sideways, diagonally. If you happen to get the step that's forwards, awesome, but take a step and then take that next step and that next step because it's that energy. It's the, it's, that's going to create some sort of Perfect. change. And when you're stuck, that's what you need. This has been a fabulous conversation. Uh, I have so enjoyed meeting and bonding with you and hearing your stories and, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Aiden. Up next, my final thoughts. I remember when I got my first salaried position in a software company as a creative, I was like, this is it. This is my moment. I found my path and I'm on it. And three years later, I was no longer on that path. 
I remember when I was cast at Esther Spallies, I was like, this is it. I finally figured it out. I finally made it. And then 11 months later, that wasn't my path anymore. And when I think about my own life and these moments where I really felt like I, I fell into something that was absolutely correct and then turned out to be simply a stepping stone, as Gigi Rowe put it. Every time that that happened, there was a period of time that followed where I questioned everything. And I think what matters most is coming through these moments, whether they work out or not, if we're able to sort of take stock of ourselves, to learn specific lessons from these experiences as we step along in our development, I think there's such a great opportunity there for us to become and step into fully who we really are. Then again, talking to some of my friends who are in their later chapters in life, I certainly have come to understand that that journey never really feels complete. And perhaps by the time you finally realize this is who I am, you're already at the end. So I guess what I'm trying to say is enjoy the ride. Take these moments as exciting steps along your journey and understand that your journey is yours. My journey is mine. Gigi Rose's journey is hers. And that we're all in our solo journeys together. Um, Maybe I should have said we're all alone together. Uh, The track that I refer to in this episode. Uh, I super enjoyed hearing Gigi's perspective today. I think it's really exciting to understand the amount of work that goes into amazing creative endeavors. But like so much, when we're really, really, really enjoying what we're doing, it almost doesn't feel like work at all, which is, I think, how you can end up spending these long, long hours and then at the end of the day be like, or three days later be like, whoa, what just happened? I encourage you to, if whatever moment you're in, whether you're just coming into an exciting opportunity or coming out of one, to take a moment to take stock of where you are. Breathe deeply into that and allow yourself to ask questions. What do you want to learn from this moment? And what do you want to take from this moment into the next? Thank you for your support of the show. Thanks for listening to the Changed Podcast. If you have any additional questions, I'd be happy to forward them on to Gigi Rowe and I'll post the answers uh, later. If you have thoughts, reactions, stories to share, send them to podcast at artofchange.com. I'm Aiden Nepom, and I wish you the kind of experiences in life you're excited to tell stories about. Mm-hmm.